Hi, I'm Jonathan Fields, and this is Good Life Project. So my guest today is Patricia Marino. Patricia has been part of the fitness and lifestyle industry for a couple of decades now, one of the thought leaders, a trendsetter, somebody who's pushed the envelope and really challenged people to explore what it means to be alive and active and take control of their lifestyles. And more recently, over the last number of years, the founder of something called Intensati and Sadi Life. So we're really going to explore this whole journey and what she's really up to now. So it's awesome to be hanging out with you today. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. We had this kind of funny connection in the past, um, like years and years and years ago. You used to teach some your variation of kickboxing out of this. It's like a fourth floor walk up on the Upper West Side in New York City. And my wife and I used to go. And I remember my wife dragged me one day. She's like, you've got to go to this class. It's amazing. And this woman is just incredible. And she's so cool and so nice. And I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. And I went kicking and screaming the first time. And I left. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> that was really cool. And that was my first exposure to you. And sort of like as you, you know, watching you move through the industry. And you had been in it long before that. But, um. I want to I wanna really spend some time talking about what you're up to now. Great. But one of my fascinations um, with folks who've been doing what you're doing and been in front of a camera, in front of crowds, and moving your body and sort of like being this thought leader and people that, you know, someone that people follow is, I'm always curious, is, was this the you that's always been there your whole life? Like, were you the kid who was out in front and moving and confident and alive and energetic? Um, or was, did you sort of like start out very differently and was there something that sort of like created a change in you that led you to this approach to life and career? Such an interesting question because I haven't really asked myself that before. And so you're asking me that I'm like replaying in my mind myself as like a five-year-old or a six-year-old. Yeah. And the things that I remember are really wanting to be a performer. Mm. You know, always the one like dancing around the house or dreaming about being a dancer and being on stage and really seeing the people in my family that had done things like that. But on the other side of that, I also was very overweight as a kid. Mm. And I really was troubled by that. In third grade, I was on a diet. You know, wow. I was like the heaviest person in my class. And so that is really a lot of what I remember mm. about growing up and struggling with my self-confidence and my weight issues and having to deal with that at a very young age. Yeah, that's tough. And you grew up in California, right? I grew up in Northern California. So you grew eight. up in a culture of sort of like, you know, like outdoor and activity and stuff like that. So Yeah, it wasn't really the culture in my own family. I have uh, 10 brothers and sisters. Oh, wow. I am <laughs> number nine of 11 and eight girls. Wow. And my mom was somebody who really valued um self-image mm. you know to her it was really important and it was something that she passed on and not in the healthiest of ways mm. i think with good intentions because right. it was her struggle and then with so many women in the family you know she really wanted us to have it all and she thought right. having it all meant looking the part first right. so that you can have it all and for her that was the access to having it all which is not completely healthy yeah. So, I mean, you're in third grade and, and you're on a diet and, and I guess the heaviest person in your grade. And, um, how do you, how do you sort of move from there to, and I, I guess what's interesting to me also is that inside you're saying, like, you feel like you're the performer and you want to be out there in front of people, but you're getting this mixed message and that, like, you need to change who you are to be that person. Yeah. I knew that I couldn't be fat and have the dream that I wanted. Right. Mm. There was really I got that really early on because I remember even just being weighed. And that, it's such a strong memory, like my dad taking me into the bathroom to weigh me and gasping at it. Yeah. Right. Like so getting like uh, this is not good. Wow. And so having that feeling of like, wow, unless I look a certain way, my life is not going to work out. Mm. And having then that struggle from a very early age and really trying to break free of that and doing it through very yeah. unsustainable means, really. So like what was your, how did you try and address it when you were younger? Well, the first thing my mom did was put me on a diet, right? right and take me to her diet doctor, which injected me with cow's urine, which oh at God. the time was the thing that women <sighs> were doing because it was something, it was a hormone that supposedly um, helped accelerate fat loss. And you know, they're doing their best. They take you to a doctor, it, you know, for adults, they would get diet pills. Right. So my mom had diet pills in her bag mm. and then she would take us to Weight Watch or she would take us to diet center or every diet that was out on the market. Right. 
you know, we were on it. But on the other flip side of that, we were also a Mexican family that grew up in the restaurant business hmm. with a table full of Mexican food and all of the foods that you shouldn't technically eat right, if you're right. wanting to change. So it was really challenging, really challenging. And I think that, you know, it really is the foundation for my work today, though. So where do you go from there? Because and, and it's fascinating to me also because, I, you know, we're sort of around the restaurant industry for a solid chunk of time. And when you're in the food industry, <laughs> It's extremely hard um, to really, I mean, I know so many people who are in that industry who work insane hours. Their life revolves 100% around food. The family re life revolves around food. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's, and if it's sort of like, you know, if it's the type of, of fare that comes out of culture, you know, the whole culture and everything, like the whole village, you know, everyone revolves around sort of like this idea of gathering around food. And a lot of the people who I know who, who have been in and out of the industry, um, while they're in the industry, are they're also working insane hours mm -hmm. because that's the industry. And they're in horrendous, horrendous physical shape. And it's sort of when you bring the family dynamic into that whole thing, it's got to be such a huge challenge. So, so how do you start to find the light out of that for yourself? Well, after just trying to deal with it with diets and things and going through that as a young adult, um, I found exercise. Hmm. Jane Fonda came out. Ah. And I remember my sister brought home the DVD, or maybe it was first the book. And we all got together in the living room and started studying the book and doing the exercises. Right. And to me, that was my first experience of like, there's a hope, there's a hint of being able to be a performer in here. I want huh. to be a dancer. And so for me, exercise kind of started to fit that need for me to move my body, yeah. right? Which in that, when I was a youngster, I thought as a dancer. But then when I started yeah. to find exercise, I actually went to a jazzercise class. Uh -huh. And I walked in with my sister and I really was like, this is what I want to do with my life. Like it was huh. that combination that would kind of save me from being the fat girl all my life, right? It was exercise, I was good at it, I was strong and I loved it even though I was overweight. Mm. Um, and then it, there was like this element where I thought I could do that. And that would really feed my soul from that performer in me or wanting to yeah. be a leader or a teacher in some way, which I didn't call it that at that time. Right. And that really began my journey and helped me find some way to just kind of have control. Yeah. Even though I didn't have control over my food at that point, it really was something I could take control of and I was good at. So it really, I feel like, has saved me in so many ways. Hmm. I, and so, I mean, what I'm curious about is that I've heard so many people say, you know, I'll exercise or I'll go to a class or I'll go to a studio once I'm fit enough. Mm -hmm. You know, and and they maybe maybe they're you know, like horrified. They look in the mirror and they're like, I really don't like the way I look. So I'm not going to go and like participate in the experience of exercise or movement, even though I love the way it feels in any way publicly, until I actually hit a point where you know like I feel like I've lost enough weight or I'm fit enough or something like that. But it seems like you just kind of said, you know what, this, I'm drawn to this. I'm just going to go out and do it. Like, was that voice in your head at all or was that not really a part of your experience? I think I had already started a little bit. You know, my sisters are older. There are these beautiful girls that are five, six and seven years older than me. And they've got the diet thing down, mm. right? Uh, not in a healthy way, but they've got it down. So I'm kind of modeling them now. I have a little bit of a role model. Mm. So they're eating more healthfully. They're starting to work out. I'm starting to see see that they're getting more and more beautiful and mm. I'm hoping I can too. And so I start to follow them and trail them and, and do what they're doing. And so I start to lose a little bit of weight. I also start growing and getting involved in like high school cheerleading, even mm. though I was more overweight, I think I just wanted it so badly and thought that would be access to me breaking free of like old ways of moving and eating. Yeah. You know. So did that, once you became more active and you really got involved in just moving a lot more, did that start to change sort of the psychology of how you were feeling also? No, not really. Only oh. in the moments that I was teaching. Really? In the moments that I was teaching, I could transcend that old self-image because there was a part of me that came alive. There was a part of me that I was able to... One of the things that I think was a big problem as far as my relationship to food was I didn't have... Of the ability to voice 
my opinions, my needs. I didn't have the, mm. didn't ask for things that I needed because I'm in this big family. I don't want to cause upset. There's a lot of fighting going on. Money's an issue. Mm. I don't want to be the problem. Mm. So instead of saying, listen, I need money for books or can I have a new pair of shoes or can I go somewhere? I hold back. Mm. and not ask for things. And I now as I look back, I start to see how that's so much the root of the problem of self-worth, you know, eating issues and, yeah. and self-image issues. But when I was teaching, I kind of stood in that place where I was seen as great. I had the talent to do it because something in me came alive when I was teaching a class. Mm. And that thing that came alive in me was the thing that nurtured my soul. But outside of that arena, I didn't have that confidence. Mm. And so I would exercise five, six, seven, eight hours a day. Wow. But then I didn't know how to manage my food because food for me was still that emotional comfort. And still was this an area of my life where I was really still out of control. Right. So even though it started to look from the outside, oh, she's getting it together. Look, she's lost weight. She's like the most popular instructor. She's getting fit, really, really fit. But the other side of it was, oh my God, I'm a big fraud because here I have this fit body and this fit persona, but I'm binging and purging where mm. nobody knows it. So, I mean, so let's, let's kind of zoom the lens a little bit. Um, because, you know, you mentioned your teaching. So at some point you start to go from participating, getting really active to starting to teach and becoming the person on the other side who's leading groups of people through mm -hmm. it. But, I, and it's what's so fascinating. I've had this conversation with so many people in various parts, whether it's yoga or fitness and where they feel like they're, they've used the word fraud. Mm -hmm. where they feel like what they're presenting is just this incredible image and maybe physically they look like they're in tremendous shape and stuff like that but when they step out of the room their you know either their relationships are a disaster or their nutrition is or something they feel like they're not standing in integrity mm -hmm. the moment that they leave the room i i wonder what it is about i mean about being in that position where um so many people I, that I've had conversations with, because you know, I ran a yoga studio, I ran mm -hmm. a health club, and and, um, and I remember having conversations, and I remember having to actually ask people to leave my, my staff when I knew that they were like hugely popular on the floor, and they had a huge following, but I knew what was happening in their private life was mm -hmm. massively destructive to them, and they were treating people around them horribly. Um, and I was concerned about them, you know, first and foremost, and we tried to resolve it when we couldn't, then, you know, I would say, I can't put you out as my representative yeah. of actually how to live a fuller life, you know, in integrity. But I, to me, you know, and you're, you're, you know, you're still very much in the industry. Do you feel like that's something that's still fairly pervasive, just sort of like across the board? I think it's pervasive in the whole world. And I yeah, think I that, guess that's true. I think that what had me switch from that place of, oh my gosh, I have a self image to protect, mm. right? I have to do these unsustainable means. I was doing drugs. I was taking, um, diet pills yeah. and hard drugs just to protect my self image. Mm. Right. And so then the integrity, the line of integrity, the gap becomes bigger and bigger yeah. and we, and we can't live in that place because we are living a life that's, that's incongruent right. with who we say we really are or want to be. So the breaking point for me was when I really, I was actually doing a TV show mm. and because my food was so out of control, you know, I would go up and down in my weight, 20 pounds, which mm. is, pretty significant. Nah. Even though I'm really tall, 10 pounds I can get away with, but 20 pounds and on TV right. as a TV host on an exercise show, the worst thing in my life happened, which was I gained weight and I got called into the executive producer's office like, what are you doing? Mm. You're fat. Why? So can you, it's like the embarrassment and the shame and the guilt, everything that I'd been trying not to hear or have somebody see was like right in my face in relationship to my dream job. Mm. This is my dream job to be on camera, on a TV show, leading, feeling important and feeling like I've got this covered. Yeah. But then the secret behind the scenes gets revealed and I have to really start to go, okay, it's time to deal because I am living out of integrity. Yeah. I am not being the person I am representing myself to be. So it's causing me to go crazy. Yeah. What happened, a few things happened. One, I got help. Mm. 
I went to a therapist mm. who really helped people with eating disorders. And mm. I really finally got, I need help. It's gone too far. And then I met a woman who taught me about integrity mm. and taught me about honesty and taught me about really saying what I needed and saying what I wanted and telling the truth. And then what I realized was when I started telling the truth, whether it was to my family or to my friends or to my partner or to my class, mm -hmm. everything changed because no longer was I trying to hide myself and not be seen and just project an image. I was actually letting people see the truth about me, which exposed any of the secrets that I was hiding. And it's secrets that are the killer yeah. of everything. So, and secrets are the thing that breeds shame and guilt. And so the very thing that I was trying to hide Actually, when I revealed it and learned to speak the truth and tell the truth and live in integrity and question, am I living in integrity? I really got that. That was the piece that was making me crazy. Mm. And that through that training, which was really, really difficult, um, I actually got that that's the answer to living a life, a wholehearted life and a yeah. life that you really love. And I love that word, word wholehearted. Um, uh, we had a conversation with Brene Brown a while back, who's an amazing, amazing, amazing woman. And, uh, and that's sort of you know, the word that she uses to represent where that person who's just good with the world and good that's with themselves That's funny because I'm is. reading her book right now. Uh, okay. That's why that word came out. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's, it's a really good word for it. And, um, and I think there's this big mythology, especially when you're in front of a camera, in front of a group of people, or when you're leading, that you have got to be like Teflon, that you've got to be perfect. You can only show the wins. And, you know, not only, like, there's nobody who wins all the time. There's nobody who's perfect. There's nobody who doesn't, you know, who's not human on any level. And we've got it in our heads that if we reveal the humanity, that somehow people will lose respect for us. Mm -hmm. And that's going to affect, you know, our self-confidence, our career, all this stuff. When, and that it shows weakness. Right, exactly. When, in fact, you know, any time that I've gone to that place, and I try and go there more and more, but you know, I'm human like everybody else, or anyone else that I know, when you really tap into it and you show it, it becomes such a powerful point of connection for people. Because all of a sudden, you know, like you're human. Yes. And, and it just, it really deepens that sense of resonance. And I think it's, you know, rather than being something that's negative, it lights you up because all of a sudden you can stand in integrity. You know, yes. the strength comes from being vulnerable. And at the same time, you connect so much more deeply with other people. And in terms of its impact on your career and your ability to do what you want to do, I think it's really powerful and really good. But so many people are terrified of going to that place and testing the idea. It's terrifying. Yeah. It's terrifying. And, you know, Brene Brown talks about vulnerability being the access to love. Yeah. And and being in that place and without being willing to live in that space of vulnerability, you actually can't be authentic, your full mm. authentic self. And it's such, it's such a challenge because even in my industry, like I really felt like that job, the job that I had of teaching, of presenting, of traveling the world, mm. aerobics competitions, like it fueled my soul. And that if I didn't have this work, I literally felt like I would die mm. because it was my self-expression. It was how I was acknowledged. It was what I felt people loved me for. And yet it kept affirming that they only loved the image, mm. right? So when I really got that, I, I remember practicing it in a class one time when I started to teach in Tensati and I was holding a Wayne Dyer book mm. because I was trying to get people to speak affirmations out loud uh -huh. to do this thing that was so different than what I'd ever been doing, which everybody freaked out about. So I was holding Wayne Dyer's book or Deepak Chopra's book and standing in front of the room and saying, Wayne Dyer says the power of your word and the power of intention. And people are like, Boop. you know, yawning and rolling right. their eyes. And the same woman that was teaching me about integrity and authenticity said, put down the book, Yeah. put down the book and tell the right. truth. Take it from the heart. And I remember standing and putting the book down and saying, I have been in my life bulimic for 20 years. The room went dead silent at all full attention. Wow. And I went, oh, huh. you wanna hear the truth. That's what's get, getting your attention. And having those like little experiments and caught making myself do that every day, yeah. I really started to get the power of it. People would cry in class. I was free 
I was no longer trying to project an image and yeah. worried that they liked me. I was more focused on telling the truth. And I really got the physical power of what that creates in a space and how you have people's hearts and ears yeah. in that space. And as a teacher and someone who's wanting to cause transformation and help people cause their own transformation, you need that space. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's amazing because it sounds like it operated on two levels, really. One is it allows you to start to move into your own self and become much more aligned just in your own life and what mm -hmm. you do. Mm -hmm. But also it gives permission, you know, because you're a leader. So it gives people, the people who are following and sort of a part of your circle of influence permission yeah. to do the same. And, um, and that, it so goes against the grain of what does. we want to do. Right. Um, that had to have led to a lot of interesting conversations with your students. <laughs> It really did, but what it led to, which was really powerful, was an opening of people's hearts. Like, instead of them just coming into class, I gotta lose weight, I gotta burn calories, like I was, right? Mm. Why is she talking so much? We gotta move, I only have one hour, this yeah. kind of feeling. It had people really get into their hearts and had them become more revealing. So they would come up to me after class. I related to that. I had that same issue. Or I went home and I told oh. my husband this or this. Or I broke up my marriage. I ended a relationship that wasn't good. So people were in my telling the truth. And I think what happened was when you tell the truth and you become vulnerable but authentic, people feel like they know you. Mm. Because yeah. they they there's a connection that's made. They relate. They feel like they know you. And that's loving relationship, letting people in and letting people know you. Mm -hmm. And then creating this kind of environment, had them see that someone who's standing in the front of the room telling the truth, how they felt about me, kind of gives you the power to go home and do it in your life. Because if I like this person, or I feel like the story, the truth that they tell, has me feel empowered or connected, or loved, then I feel more strength to go home and do it with my kids, with my boss, with my wife, with mm. my husband. And maybe they'll feel the same way towards me that I feel towards yes. Patricia. Yeah, yes. it's like the dots start to connect. Yes. How powerful does that feel to you to start to be in that position? It's really powerful and it's still really scary yeah, every I time. Bet. Because every time I think of something like, oh, I'm gonna start class and I'm gonna tell them I just had a miscarriage. Mm. I'm really going to do that? I don't want to do that. Mm. I don't want them to see me cry and see my disappointment, you know, and then I go, you have to do it. Mm. That's, that's, those are the best moments when you do that. And I still have to be like, just say it. Just say you're scared. Just say you want, you really want this job. Just say you're sad. Mm. You're mad at the world because you still don't have a baby. Mm. And every time I do it, I get what I've always wanted, which is the feeling of connection. I get the feeling of connection. I feel everybody that's in my class that we are connected. And that's what we all crave is that level of connection and being part of a community and yeah. being seen and being heard. And yet it's only accessible through vulnerability. Yeah. And it's so freaking scary. It and is. it's still scary. And I, like, I, I wonder if it ever changes on that level because it's almost to me like when you know if i i remember when i was teaching yoga or when i you know, i speak now and i'll speak in front of large rooms of people um and in the beginning it was ter absolutely terrifying i mean like i would literally shake for 10 minutes before i'd get on stage and five minutes later i'm having the time of my life but you know and in the beginning i was like i can't wait to, till i get to the point where i just go out there and i'm totally calm and i don't shake and i'm not nervous and it's just easy peasy and A, it's never come. <laughs> but B, I also wonder, you know, like, is that also the point where I'm no longer truly invested in what I'm doing? Like, I want to feel like I'm a little bit on edge every time I get up in front of a group because it means that I care. It shows that I, like, it's, I'm emotionally invested in developing a connection and doing something meaningful mm -hmm. and sharing, creating experience that is in some way leaves people different than when they showed up. And if I don't feel that, I kind of feel like, even though it's not always a comfortable feeling, um, I want to feel it because it's a signpost to me yeah. that what I'm doing matters, both to me and to hopefully the people that are there with me. So 
I think it probably gets easier, but I think if you're constantly exploring and seeking and looking to grow and helping other, you know, create experiences mm-hmm. that create that same, that that never truly goes away entirely. Yeah, it shifts. What I used to feel when I would go teach a class was this really intense nerves, right? Mm. And even after 10, 15 years, like every single class. Yeah, I'm class, like thinking you, you're like, you've like, like a million classes. Is this <laughs> ever going to go away? But what now looking back, right? And now doing it a different way and being that person who stands in front of the room and reveals myself and tells the truth and knows. I know now the difference. One is what I used to think is, are they going to like me? Is this going to be my final class? Is this class going to be good enough? Mm. And always protecting my self-image. Are they going to like me? Mm. Which made me nervous. Then as I started to change how I was interacting with with people and no longer worried about, are they going to like me? Then, and starting to reveal and getting that, oh, what has people really like me for me is to Mm. be me. So every time I tell a story that reveals a part of me, not only am I not focused on how I look, I'm more invested on what they get. Yeah. And then when I'm more invested in what they get, I get almost, when I get scared and I go, oh my gosh, this is going to be hard to say. At the same moment, I go, oh my gosh, this is going to be powerful. Yeah, no doubt. And so that helps me. But I'm always looking in my life like, is this going to be an intro? Is this going to be an intro in my class tomorrow? Is this going to be an intro? So it kind of helps you redefine what bad is yeah. because it actually serves a purpose. No, I totally agree. I mean, I remember when I was teaching yoga, because I, I would always start out, and a lot of people in the yoga world would read some sort of, you know, something that would mm-hmm. either a chant or something from like the ancient wisdom. And I would just start out with something that happened in my life or like a quick thought or a quick story. And it does, it, it changes your life. I mean, it's interesting. I, I use Instagram, like the little app on my camera, on my iPhone. And what I noticed immediately was that the fact that I knew that I had it on there started making me look at the world a lot more because mm-hmm. I was constantly just looking around. I'm like, can I capture that and share it in an interesting way that would some way like, you know, serve others. Mm-hmm. And so I just started seeing a lot more um, once I started using it. And it was an interesting thing when I was teaching on a regular basis too. I think I, I felt that same sense of I'm going to engage fully. And some stuff's going to go right and some stuff's going to go wrong. But you know what? It's still stuff that can allow me to be in service of others and share whatever goes wrong. And in some way, maybe I'll benefit. And in some way, maybe we can all benefit in some way from it. doesn't mean that it doesn't like suck when it's actually happening. You know, it's like not everything in life is fun, but at least you can like, you can put this bigger lens on it mm-hmm. that says in some way this can be in service of something bigger. And it's, And I I remember asking class one time, or it was a New Year's Eve class, and every New Year's Eve I do a big class, and part of what it is is at the end, people share. They just share what they were up against this year, Mm. what failures they had, what successes they had, what they love. It doesn't really matter. They just have the opportunity to share. And I remember one time somebody saying, what I love about you the most, meaning me, is when you fail Mm. and when you share things that go wrong. And your life isn't perfect. And all of those little kind of acknowledgements about when you're not perfect, when things aren't great for you, that's when we love you the most. Like that's when we, because we feel we can connect to you the most. Really, it keeps fueling me to really one, not only just look at my imperfections as opportunities, but also to really lighten up about them because I see every day how in service they are to other people. But then I also can't stay in that place. Like I was thinking this morning, one of the things that's like so off for me right now is I have three kids. I have eight month old twins and a two year old. So my work day has gone down to really like four hours a day if I'm lucky and I have a growing business and I have growing projects and I have things that I always want to keep adding to my workload instead of taking away. And it's like everything is a total mess. And I'm someone who really is like, try to keep my word. And if I say I'm going to do something, I do my best to try to do it. And I'm failing miserably right now because I'm trying to fit my old life into my new life Mm. and try to still do those same things. And so I keep, instead of just 
hearing myself going, oh my God, you're losing. This is not working. How can you say you're someone who leads this lifestyle? So it's that conversation like never stops. Mm -hmm. You just learn to interrupt it. And so even right now going, okay, I'm failing. This is not working. What needs to be readjusted? But to be able to say it, like today when I go teach class, it'll be my intro and I'll talk about how I'm failing in this area and how I'm having to reflect about how to make priorities. Mm. But they don't just want to hear me say, oh my God, I so rock. I just got this deal and this deal and look at me. I lost five pounds. I'm amazing. (laughs) Right? That's like, you want to kill yourself if you hear somebody teach like that. Yeah, I mean, it's so powerful to hear you say that also, and just to like share your truth. Um, I think one of the things that makes it so powerful is that so few people do it, and when they do, they do it so infrequently. Especially mm-hmm. people who are in the position of, of being leaders, leaders of tribes, leaders of communities. Um, you know, it's, I, I wonder what would happen if you just got, you know, if, if there was a week yeah, you know, like if we designated like vulnerability week, you know, one week a year in the country and everybody had to kind of just come clean. Mm-hmm. It would be amazing. <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden you're like, you'd have a whole bunch of disasters and a whole bunch of crying and a whole bunch of screaming and yelling. And, but like once that was out there, I, I, the context, I think that, that would shift between relationships between so many people and business mm-hmm. and life and work, everything would be pretty profound. Um, it would be really profound because really we want to be ourselves. Like there's something in us. Like I believe that we're born to bring something unique, right? The, our opinion, our view of life causes us to create something in the world that no one else can create because there's no one that has our point of view. There's no one that's had our struggles that then creates some answer to that struggle for ourselves personally, but it doesn't come through in its highest form unless we're really willing to be ourselves. Because how could it come through if we're not really honoring that our opinion and our word and our point of view really matters and really is enough? And so if more people were really willing to fully be themselves and not worry about, oh, I hope you like me, but we're really more worried I hope I can bring something to you. I hope I can make your life better. I hope I can be of service to humanity in some way, whether it's in my family, whether it's in my community, whether it's me at work, whether it's me with the Starbucks guy. But if I have that intention, then what I'm doing is I'm worrying less about if you like me, Mm. then I can really tell the truth. And I think if people, we could get that more, really get that more, the value of that, the value of how that impacts the world, then I think more people would be willing to do it. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And one thing that pops into my head is funny also when I think of a lot of people who go into the fitness industry um, as, as instructors, my experience has always been a lot of what draws people to that initially is it's about them wanting mm-hmm. a stage. Uh, but people, I mean, we know this, like the burnout rate in the industry is is insane. People generally don't last very long. And I wonder if the people who really last long, at some point along the way, make the shift of, okay, this isn't about me. This has got to be in service of, Mm -hmm. or else um, Mm -hmm. it's just not going to work. I don't know. What do you think? You know, I've been teaching for a really long time. I started teaching in 1982. Mm -hmm. So it's really been, I've done that whole journey, right? I've really gotten like, the burnout rate was going to happen. I was burnt out 15 years ago. <laughs> right? And then I had to really get like, oh, what's going to get me re-inspired, reinvested in something that I actually really love is really focusing on them. What is, what's, because I come from a family of overweight people who struggle with their weight. I have sisters who are very overweight. And I remember being in New York City and teaching to New Yorkers. They're thin people that want to just get thinner. Mm. They're not, we're not, I'm not teaching to really overweight people. There are a few that maybe have 20 pounds, Mm. maybe 30 pounds, but I don't often get those people who are really, really struggling with enormous numbers. And really thinking, 
I'm teaching to an elite group of people who, yes, they have their own issues and probably like me are struggling in other ways, but they, it's not physical weight that they're dealing with. And here I have a family of sisters who are extremely overweight and I am considered top in my field. I'm considered, I, you know, I'm on the magazines. I have DVDs. I have a TV show. I'm in aerobics competitions. I'm like, I'm traveling the world. Nike sponsoring me, Reebok sponsoring me, and just got flown to Russia and Japan and mm. everywhere. And I am still not causing a shift in the population, in my family. Mm. So where's the disconnect? How come what I'm preaching as the answer to health and fitness is not really the answer to health and fitness. So when I started to go, what is that thing? What's the difference? How does even someone like me, who is devoted to working out, cause that shift that makes it a lifelong shift versus, in my own experience, running away from being fat mm. and holding that mindset? And how do we take that into the community where it really impacts people instead of just feeding into, you better look good, mm -hmm. or he's not going to love you, you better look good or you're not going to get that job, or you better look good, or probably in a couple years, you're finished. Mm -hmm. right? And so I think our industry can actually feed more into that than to help people shift into an empowering yeah. perception of, I'm worthy even if I'm 10 pounds overweight, right. or 20 pounds, or 30 pounds. Because without that acknowledgement first, you can't even change your diet because you're using the food to keep feeding that place within you that can't be fed with food. Mm. So does this then become the genesis for what you're doing now? Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. So right now, you got, I guess there are a couple brands that all work together. You developed something called Intensati. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to me a little bit about how this came to life and what it is. It really came from this conversation of what is that piece even for myself, that's going to help me stop feeling like I am in a moment going to explode back to 212 pounds, right? Why do I have, why is it that I'm still living with this fear that that thing is going to come and the fat girl suit is going to take over my body? Mm. What's the difference between someone like lives like that and someone who is just like, I've changed. I've changed. Mm. I'm no longer running away. This is really who I am. And just starting to explore, like, what is that? And what is it that in my family, just looking at my family, that no matter how they're trying and trying to lose weight and trying to diet and trying to exercise, what's the missing piece? Mm. Everybody knows what to eat. Everybody that, knows if you exercise. Yeah, it's not just a straight knowledge. because it's been. Right. It's not the knowledge. And it's not even doing it. It's living it. It's changing. It's yeah. transforming how you see yourself. It's transforming how you speak to yourself. It's transforming the place of fear. Oh my God, I'm going to be fat and not be loved to a place of love. I respect myself. I respect my life. I respect my work. I honor myself. It's going back to the conversation of integrity. Yeah. And how do I live in integrity so that I'm not hoping you'll love me so I have self-worth, but I love me more and enough so that whether you love me or not, it doesn't matter. It's all good, yeah. And so it was that, like, I really went into meditation and prayer and journaling. What's the answer? And it was allowed. I, I would go into Starbucks every day before I taught class and for an hour just write, what's the answer? What's the answer? Mm. What's the answer? Because I knew it had to be divine, yeah. <laughs> divine inspiration. And there were really very two significant points questioning and questioning and then going okay and I remember Michael Port was somebody was a friend of mine in the gym and he said I'm changing I'm going to be a life coach I'm like what's a life coach and he says it's somebody who really supports people and causing transformation in their life I'm like I want to be a life coach <laughs> how do you be a life coach and I that was so powerful because I remember going home and sitting in front of the tv it was lunchtime I was eating lunch in front of the tv and I see an Anthony Robbins ad you know, Anthony Robbins, yeah, sure. like the major motivator. And this was probably 12 years ago by now and thinking, oh my gosh, I bet he has the answer. I bet he has the answer. And so I enrolled in his university. And one of the things we had to do is we went to the Bahamas and there's a hundred of us marching on the beach mm -hmm. and we're speaking affirmations. All I need is within me now, all I need. And I go, that's 
it. That's it. I got it. I was like jumping up and down, crying and laughing and chills. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I got it. A class, a workout that combines affirmations. Affirmations. How do we change the way we think? How do we change the way we see ourselves? It's the inner dialogue that has to change. So it was like, I got on a bike, I started pedaling my legs, and I'm crying and laughing. I put a towel over my head because it's like <laughs> I'm causing a scene in this gym. But I'm like, I got it. And, you know, it was just the beginning. It's like, well, then how do you do that? And then I remember there was another piece where I'm walking down Broadway. I'm coming out of the gym. I am an avid reader. I'm reading everything on metaphysics and spirituality and personal improvement, trying to find the answer to how am I going to take this to the next level? And I walk down Broadway and I see this white piece of paper with little tear things. Mm, And it's in very small print. And it says, meet Wayne Dyer's guru. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I've always wanted to meet Wayne Dyer's guru. He would write about him and I'm thinking, I love Wayne Dyer, but why not meet his guru? And I see that the teaching that his guru is doing is like down the street on Fifth Avenue at a church and it's happening right now. <laughs> it's happening literally in like 10 it's a minutes. divine intervention. I run, I run, I run. And I run in, it's at a church. Everybody's sitting down in silence. Wayne Dyer's guru is sitting at the front of the church in a meditation pose. And I'm like, what is going on? I'm kind of freaked out. Because I don't know what any, what's going to happen. And I sit down in a pew. I really feel like they're waiting for me. That's what it felt like. Mm-hmm. I'm the last one. I sit down. And it's like as soon as I sit down, he opens his eyes. And he just says, you are what you think you are. And again, just poured, tears poured down. I didn't hear another word. Mm-hmm. But it was an f- affirmation for me. It was like, okay, I'll do it. That's the answer you're giving me. That's the road I'm taking. So the affirmations plus that final confirmation, you know, it's more of a knowing, Mm. right? And I was like, okay, let's see what happens. And then I just worked on trying to create a format that worked. And that was how Intensati was really born. So the the first time you bring this new blended thing, which is movement and affirmations, to a classroom the very first time. Are you freaked out about it? It was not good. <laughs> it was not good. Right, because it's like everything is generally like not good the first time you do it, but, but this is like a whole different thing also. I mean, you've got like It a- wasn't even not good because the class wasn't good. One of the things that I knew that I had is I can kick your ass. Right. And I know that. And I know that's what they love about my class. I know that. So I know if I give them that, then I can add anything on top of that. But I have to give them what they're coming to me for first. So I design a class that is very still in a line with what people love about my class. Mm. It's very intense. But while we're doing this very intense workout, I want you to speak now. Mm. When we're doing these punches, I want you to say out loud, I am strong now. So I'm saying, and it wasn't quite the format that I have now because it's evolved, but it would be kind of interjecting in different exercises. Come on, say yes. Say, I am strong. Crickets. Like people will be like, (laughs) right. So I try again, nothing. Stand in front of the room. I'm reading the Wayne Dyer book. Nothing. People are even kind of rolling their eyes, but I'm giving them the workout. They're coming back. Finally, one of the group exercise managers comes up to me and she says, right before class, this is one minute before I'm about to teach class, class is packed, 60, 65 people in the room. And she says, you don't, you asked me if anybody had ever given feedback about your class, right? And I'm going like, of course, it's positive feedback. She goes, well, I have been getting some feedback that you talk too much. <laughs> oh, no. And that why don't you just talk? at the end of your class. So I uh, go into the bathroom, steam. You can't even uh, imagine the steam. One, ego. Two, I'm scared as hell already right. to do this class. Now you're telling me I can't do the piece that I am saying is the answer to the world, mm. that I believe is the answer. Now you're telling me not to do that piece. So I have to go deal. I'm in the bathroom. I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I'm like, I have a major like march in the room. I stand in front of the room. Everybody's waiting there. I said, so I just got some feedback. (laughs) I said, I just got some feedback from a manager that people have been writing 
that I shouldn't talk so much. I said, let's have a little conversation. This class is called Intensati. I have a lot of classes on the schedule. In fact, there's hundreds of classes on this schedule. You are free to take any, and you're even free to take my other classes. This class is different. This class is going to cause you to go deeper. And what we do in this class is we speak affirmations. So if you're not going to speak the affirmations and you don't want to participate in this class, please leave. If you're going to participate in this class, you must participate fully mm. or don't ever come back to this class again. You're welcome in any of the other hundreds of classes. They start applauding. <laughs> Nobody wants to be the one that said they wrote the note, right? right so right, everybody's right, right. applauding. That was a breakthrough moment. They started talking. They started crying. They started mm. feeling. They started giving it. And so there was enough momentum from that day on that even if there were 60 people in class and only 30 were talking, the other 30 were, then felt like the odd man yeah, out. Yeah, right. And so there was that shift. And once you experience it, there's no denying it's empowering. There's no denying it's, it's different. And even if you can't put your words to it, you feel empowered. And so that was enough to really start, it gave me confidence, more confidence, and kind of, I got pissed off, so that pissed yeah. offness kind of gave me the confidence to be able to say, do it or don't do it, but don't show up and not do it. Yeah, which is a huge thing too, because so many people would hit that moment and say, okay, well then I gotta water it down because I got bills to pay and I have that. Okay, valid, like we all have concerns that we have to put food on the table, but this was like, this was your thing. This was, in your mind, you're saying, this is it. This is the answer. There's no backing down off of this. And like, so the will, I mean, I think that's, that's the thing that makes you be able to go into that room and say, I don't care if this doesn't vibe with you. I'm not changing it because this is powerful. Do it or don't, don't come back if you don't want, but the experience is what it is. And I, and, um, I think so many people are terrified to do that, to do what it's you did. It's terrifying. Yeah. It's terrifying. Me included, by the way. I'm not, I'm not like a superstar. You know, like it's, it's when, when you, you really find believe that thing, it. Yeah. When I mean, you, that's it, what it is. I believed it. I, I had literally, I, I knew it there. You couldn't change my mind. And I knew that this was the answer to mm. what so many people wanted. And, you know, as scared as I was, I was like, you just don't know it yet. Mm. This is it. You do want this. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. So you've been doing that now. When did Intensati, when did you start to introduce that? 2012 was like the first class on the schedule. So this is like going on about, you know, a year, a little over a year while we're filming it now, maybe less. Um, 2000, and, what am I saying? 2002, okay. not 2012. All right, because I'm thinking, I thought it was a lot longer than that. <laughs> no, no, I am like can't even All believe. Right. Like, so going more in, like 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> right, so a full decade. Um, and it's exploded into something much bigger. Now it's, you know, you have, I guess you're, you're certifying teachers, you're training people to teach this around the world. Yes, I am. I have, I've certified about 300 teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, it's nowhere near my vision. Mm -hmm. It's nowhere near my vision for this because I really think that I want this to be the way that we train. I want this to be the way that we're working out in the gyms. I want the conversation that what you think matters in the transformation of your body and the effectiveness of your workout, in the effectiveness of how much joy you experience in life happens with your thoughts, with how you speak to yourself, with what you think about yourself. Because I think that, I think we're evolving, right? We keep evolving. Yeah. We've got to go there next. Where else are we going to go? We're not going to go backwards. And so my vision is that it's like yoga. It's just the way that we train. It's a module. It's a modality that is mm. part of, part of the culture. And so that soon, in my mind, it's going to be soon. <laughs> Although 10 years, I was hoping it would be sooner than 10 years already. That this is just, people are doing this. And that's really my commitment for it. Mm. So I feel like there's a big gap between where I am now and where I want to go. Yes, I've covered a lot of ground and had to push up against a lot of cynics and a lot of people who say, sounds great, but my class wouldn't like it. Or it sounds great, but I couldn't teach it. Mm. So there's still a lot of that to really deal with, to find leaders who are willing to stand in front of a room and say the truth, 
really yeah. and just like what they're really dealing with a lot of people can't handle that yet no nah. it's really tough so it's an amazing vision let's let's take this whole thing full circle so you started out you've grown into this extraordinary you've gone through an incredible personal journey now you're a mom mm. now you've got three kids that you're bringing up um terrifying nah. <laughs> Because you, I mean, it's it's got to be know part of too like much. What, <laughs> right? Because you've been through this really intense experience of transformation. So, um, what's really important to you about the experience that you want to create and the belief system that you want to help bring to your kids? For me, it's that conversation of authenticity, honesty, and integrity. Right? Because with that, when you value yourself enough, all the decisions you make from that place whether it's what to eat, whether it's what job to take, whether it's who to love, if you can honor yourself to that extent and you're not trying to please other people, you'll make the choices that are most in line with your higher self, mm. right? Because you're in the space of self-love and self-respect. And to me, that's the most important. I get tied up in, oh my God, we're feeding too many sugars to, you know, to yeah. my daughter. Or, Please don't give them goldfish. Can't we give them sliced apples? Right. Because... <laughs> In my family, we grew up eating donuts and chips, and and to me, that caused me so much suffering that I don't want to have that. But I also have to really get there was so much more going on, and that when I really bring up my girls in a place where they are loved, they are taught how to communicate, they are valued, their opinion matters, and that I always tell them there's nothing they can do that will take I can take my love away for. Right? I will love them. And I think in the space of love and seeing people and valuing people, they become who they're meant to be. And it's, it still frightens me that I'm going to be, they're going to be talking about me to their therapist or something. You know, my mom wouldn't let me eat goldfish when I was, right. you know, and I, I just have to live with it's probably going to happen. But it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I'll do the best that I can. I love it. So the name of this project is called Good Life Project. So when I offer that phrase to you, to live a good life, what comes up? To live a life that has love and connection. You know, a deep relationship with my wife and with my children. That to me, if I have that, really have that, not just on the surface, but that we are connected and we are a family that is experiencing the world together from that place, to me, that's a good life. And also a life that is healthy and productive. And when I say productive, I mean that the thing that I'm yearning to create in the world, that the things that I really want to leave behind really get left behind. That my work matters. That my that makes me cry. Yeah. It's awesome. I, that's like my mark of truth. When I make myself cry, you know, and the, and the, the initial response is to try to swallow it. And I just know that when the tears are there, it's like I hit my own nerve. Mm. And I think that's, <clears throat> that's really what I want. I want my work to matter. Because I think everybody wants that. They want to matter. They want to feel valued. They want to feel seen. And I think that by doing the work that I do, I can help people have that experience that they matter. Yeah, it's beautiful. I thank you for sharing that. Mm. It's been an amazing conversation. Thank you, it has. So helpful, so powerful. Um, blown away by what you're doing in the world and, that, and, and how you're leading, the way that you're leading, the message that you're bringing to people. Thank you. So thank you for sharing this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me because it's, important for me to get the word out whatever the word is yeah. but that there is more to just banging your physical body into a likable shape yeah. right that it's more from the inside love it thank you thanks so i'm jonathan fields and my guest today has been patricia marino signing off for good life project mm -hmm.